Good morning, everyone. We're really glad that you've joined us today for church. Before we get to worship, though, we'd like to get things started off with some announcements. Specifically, we'll start with welcoming all of our first-time guests and visitors with us today. If it is your very first time, we're glad that you're here, but we would also love to connect with you a little more. And if you haven't stopped by the welcome desk yet, make sure you do that after the service is over because we have a gift we'd like to give you to say thanks for being here today. The other thing you can do to connect is to fill out the connection card, which is found in the pocket in the seat back in front of you. On one side, it has two QR codes. You scan one of those, it'll take you to the online version of the paper form that's on the back side of that card. You can put that card either in the offering containers when they pass, or you can still stop by the welcome desk after church is over to make sure that we get that info. Ladies, our next Connections event for June is coming up very quickly. It will be on Saturday, June 15th at 10 a.m. And this month it will be a kayaking adventure with myself and some of my other friends who own kayaks. We'll be meeting down at Hopewell Lake in French Creek State Park at 10 a.m. Again, that's June 15th. And if you have any interest at all in trying out the kayaks, you can come prepared to do that. If you'd like to come and just hang out, play games, chat, but not do the kayaks, that's okay too. No experience is needed. We'll help you along with everything you need to do. We do ask that you sign up ahead of time if you're able to, and be sure to stop by the welcome desk to pick up a map of the park so you know exactly where it is we plan to meet. Also be sure to bring a bagged lunch for that day, as well as some chairs to sit in. And if you have any games that you'd like to play that day, bring those along as well. Good morning, EBFC. My name is Becky Demko, and I have a few announcements to give you about our upcoming VBS. It is officially June, which means it is VBS month. VBS is June 17th to 20th in the evening. The theme this year is Jungle Journey. If you're not registered yet, make sure you go on our website and register. We also have postcards available down at the welcome desk that you can take to give out to your friends to invite them to join us at VBS as well. If you are signed up to volunteer, we have a meeting today after the service will take place right here in the sanctuary. So stick around, it won't be too long. We'll give a few more last minute details before VBS kicks off in a couple weeks. Another VBS announcement, we have our crafting evening, which will take place tomorrow here at the church. It'll be in the cafeteria and the front doors will be unlocked for you to come and join. If you are coming to that, if you have extra scissors that you can bring and an extra hot glue gun, please bring that and also wear something that you don't mind getting dirty in case you might be doing a little bit of painting or something like that. So today is the deadline for our Amazon wish list donations. If you still wanted to buy something, please do it very soon. Um, but everything's been trickling in and we are so thankful for all those donations that you guys have made. We need cardboard tubes from paper towel rolls, so the longer ones, and even if you have ones from wrapping paper or the short paper towel or the short cardboard tubes from toilet paper rolls. We need those. We don't need the actual toilet paper or the paper towel. We just need the cardboard tube in the middle. We'll keep collecting those until June 16th. If you bring them to church, you can drop them off at the welcome desk and I'll bring them where they need to go. If you are hoping to help out with setup for VBS, that's going to be starting very soon. We're waiting for school to finish out here so that we can take over the building and turn it into a giant jungle. We'll be kicking off decorating June 10th. Keep an eye on the e-bulletin next week and also for emails coming out this week to let you know specific times and dates of when we will be setting up here and we'd love to have help. <laughs> Today is the deadline for those of you who are graduating to let us know so that we can recognize you properly during our Sunday morning service next Sunday. We'd like to know by the end of the day today just so that we can start the week off prepared. If you need information on how to contact the church office, just check the e-bulletin. Another announcement for you regarding children's ministry. Just like last year when we took a little bit of break for a summer, we're going to do that again this year. This will be our last week that we are having Sunday school. We are still gonna have the nursery open through the next little bit, but we're gonna pause on Sunday school, give our teachers and our volunteers a little bit of a break. And especially with this month being busy with VBS and church picnics and fifth Sunday, this seemed like a good time to take a little bit of a summer break. The plan is to get back with our Sunday school mid-July, but we really need some extra volunteers in our children's ministry. Specifically, we need one to two teachers in Sunday school, one to two classroom volunteers, and we could really use three to four more volunteers to help out in our nursery. Our nursery's been getting very full and we could use some extra bodies in there to help with that. So if you've been thinking about volunteering, 
please reach out to me. I'd love to get you plugged in and let you know what we need to do to get you in there. So stay tuned for more information as we get closer to the start up of Sunday school again, but this will be our last week and then we will pause. It's a new month and that means a few things, which one of those is that our monthly calendar is available for you to grab. You can either grab it on the doors in the sanctuary on your way out, or you can stop by the welcome desk in the lower lobby and make sure to grab one of those. It has all the information about everything that's upcoming on our church calendar for the month of June. One of those things specifically I'd like to make you aware of is our men's Bible study, which happens every first Tuesday of the month here at the church at 615. So that is Tuesday the 4th here at the church. Any man is welcome. There's no signups or anything, but if you're interested, we'd love to see you here Tuesday night at 615. Those are all the announcements we have for today. As always, we encourage you to check out our e-bulletin, which you can do by pulling the card out of the seat pocket in front of you and scanning the QR code that takes you to our weekly e-bulletin. Also, you can go to our website and check it out there. That's www.exeterbfc.org backslash bulletins. Two other things that we just wanna make a quick mention of, but you can find more details about these events in the bulletin is our annual church picnic, which is coming up on June 23rd at 11 a.m. Also, if you had any interest in attending the Reading Phillies game that is coming up in August, you'll need to purchase your tickets from Pete and Yvonne Schallenberger later this month. So again, check out the details for those two events in this week's e -Bolton. At this time, we invite you to stand and greet your neighbors, and then we will continue in our time of worship. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're ready to sing with us as we open this morning with a familiar song and open the eyes of my heart, and then we'll move into He is Exalted. But let's start our, our service this morning declaring these praises and making these prayers that we desire to see more of our Lord and Savior. We desire to be changed and transformed because we deserve He's worthy of the praise we give Him, not just with these songs, not just with this hour and a half on a Sunday morning, but also with everything that we can give Him our lives, the breath in our lungs, and the way we choose to live for Him. So let's sing together. Sing holy, holy. 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing that again. Make that your prayer this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Sing holy, holy. again holy 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 i want to see you we're going to split off here with holies and open the eyes to see you. Let's do that split one more time. Holy and open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's go back to just the holy, holy, holy all together. Holy, holy. Forever is true shall 
As we move into our time of morning prayer and offering, I'll have the men come forward, but let's bow our heads as we pray. God, I thank you that we can stand in this place or sit. Um, God, even at times we can kneel before you. We can praise your name and declare things like you're worthy. We exalt you, that you're worthy of that praise. And I thank you that we, we have the ability to, to praise you in that way with song, God. I also pray that this morning is... We come with those songs that hopefully they can reflect what's in our hearts, but I know, God, there's many things that we distract ourselves with that we choose over you, that we choose over bringing glory to your name. And so, Father, first and foremost, I know for myself, I pray that you would allow me the humility to, to serve you, God, fully, to be able to dedicate every breath, because I know there's more breaths I can breathe for you, God. I pray that... As we turn to you, as we worship you, as we look to you for your word, and, and God, we want to grow closer to you. I pray that we would allow those things to penetrate our heart, God, that you would change and transform us. God, make us new. Make us um, closer to you as we walk with you, as we talk with you, whatever that may look like in our own lives, God. We know there's many needs in our, in our own lives and the lives of this congregation. Father, we also lift those up to you, whether it's it's sickness, God, um, whether it's those who have turned from you um, and are currently seeking um, not the things of God. God, if it's even things like doubt in our own hearts on whether you love us, whether you can forgive us despite our, our lives and our actions, God, I pray that you would remind us of your peace, of your comfort, of your forgiveness and your mercy. And God, ultimately, that we can look up and see our Savior on the cross, that we can be able to seek that forgiveness from you and you alone, God. We thank you for that sacrifice. And God, if you choose to bring us healing in whatever way that looks like, if you choose to bring healing to our family members or our friends or those who are hurting in the world, for your glory, we pray for that, God. But also remind us that sometimes there can be glory in our pain and suffering, just as Jesus Christ suffered, God. I pray that ultimately every part of our hearts would turn to you, no matter how difficult, God, that we surrender those things. But uh, 
just remind us, help us to remember that it is worth it, God, that you are so much greater and mightier than whatever else can come against us. We love you. We thank you again for allowing us to worship this morning. And as we continue, even with the giving of our tithes and offerings, God, that you would be glorified in it, that you would move your kingdom here on earth um, through something as simple as our trust and faith in you being the one in control of all things. God, thank you for allowing us to be used for your kingdom as this church, and whatever that looks like, whether it's through things like children's ministry or um, and VBS or even God through through food pantry. I pray that you allow us more interactions to build your kingdom and to influence others for the kingdom with your word, your truth, your grace, and your mercy, God. We love you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And as those containers are being passed, we'll also dismiss our kids for the last time for a few weeks to go to their classrooms. So if the kids are in here still, make sure they make their way to the back and then they can head downstairs together. And then once those containers, the offering containers are passed as well, we will also uh, take a moment to continue in worship with one more song as Christine leads us in the hymn in the garden. So if you're able, please stand um, as is convenient with the containers being passed as well. So don't rush. I can see some of the kids are still making their way, so I'll stall just a few more moments. But yes, if you're able, please stand as we sing together. Good morning. Let's begin with some prayer, or continue in prayer. Dear Lord, God, again, as we gather here together in your son's name, Lord, um, God, I pray that we would worship you well. Lord, thank you for allowing us to worship you, to have a relationship 
with you. Lord, it's serious to be called a Christian. Pray that we would live uh, the way that you desire us to. I pray as we look into your word today uh, that we would apply it, Lord, that we would understand it, that, uh, Lord, you would bring to fruition the, the studies that I put into your word in order to um, exegete it properly. Again, Lord, it's one thing to know your word. It's a whole other thing to apply it. And so I pray that we would both learn it and apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so again, we're in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're in chapter 6. We're going to go verses 1 through 11 today, uh, Lord willing. And um, I'm going to start just a little bit different, just because I, I just felt like it's the proper thing to do this week. So maybe every week, I don't know. But we are reading God's word. It is God's word and if you are able, I would like you to stand for the reading of God's word. And so in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more matters of this life? If then you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his, brother, his brethren? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers? Actually then, it is already a defeat for you. that you have lawsuits with one another? Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. <clears throat> Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. All right, you can have a seat. We're going to dive into expounding upon God's word. And so verses 1 through 8, we're really going to look at Christians and civil court and how we should handle things. It's really quite uh, just immediately applicable. And verses uh, 9 through 11, we're going to dive a little bit more into like doctrine and theology and some cultural issues of our day, and Lord willing, giving you some tools in how to handle these cultural issues with others. But I need to say some things out the gate. What's being talked about here is civil court, not criminal court. There is a big difference there. The church as a whole, unfortunately, especially in the West, has very recently received massive black eyes because they sweep over criminal matters. They say, well, we're just going to handle these things in-house. When there are criminal matters that come up within a church that really ought to be handled, by the law. So this is speaking of civil matters. If you commit a crime and you come to a church and tell me, it, there is some discernment that must be used there. But for the most part, I'm probably going to tell you, you need to go turn yourself in. I will give you time to do that yourself, but just know I'm going to wreck you out. Like I'm not that guy. And I try to tell people, you know, before you tell me some things, Listen, if you're coming to me for spiritual care, so be it. If you're coming to me with things that you have to confess that need to be dealt with, we're going to deal with those things. And it's important to know that out the gate. And it's, it really is a line there because sometimes you may tell me something where I'm like, you know what? It's in the past. You're a different person. We've got to move forward. But there's other times where you've got to make things right. And the Bible's pretty clear on that. But again, it's hard to know when. When I was a pastor in California, we had a guy come. And I was a youth pastor. And my best friend was the assistant pastor of the church. And it was just a random Friday. Uh, and most of the pastors took off on Friday, and me and Kevin happened to be there. And a guy came to the front office, and he said, you want to talk to a pastor? So I went down there, and Kevin came from his office. We got there about the same time. And the guy said, hey, I just became a Christian yesterday, and I'm a meth dealer, and I want to hand over all of my meth lab. And he had in the back of his little car an entire, like, meth lab. Now, I really honestly knew, like, nothing of meth. And he had all these vials of liquid meth, like, all this, a, lo a lot of stuff. And we ended up talking with him, um, and somebody called the police. It actually wasn't us, because we took him out to dinner to try to talk to him. We were going to put him up at a hotel for the night um, and tell him, listen, 
Uh, awesome. Praise God you became a Christian. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the Lord will forgive you, but there's consequences for your actions. You are going to have to turn yourself in. If you don't, we're, we're going to have to tell the police at some point who you are. And the cops actually came and literally like courted off the entire church property. It was a very big deal. And they were very interesting with us trying to get the guy's information and stuff. And I, at that point, I just felt it was my calling to actually protect the individual for at least another day. I said, I'm giving the guy the right opportunity to turn himself in. Well, he disappeared. So probably maybe not the best opportunity, but a lot of meth got off the streets. I say all that because I honestly don't know before the Lord whether I was right or wrong in that. I, I honestly don't. I've, I've looked at it over the years and really struggled. Like, should I have just immediately turned the guy over? What should I have done? Um, it's, it's not always so black and white. Sometimes the Bible is incredibly, hey, this is how it needs to be done. Sometimes it's a little harder. And when, when you're dealing with non-believers in a criminal situation, especially as a pastor, right? They're coming us to say, hey, I want to turn my life around. Am I then going to say, well, not before you're doing jail time? Sometimes I think that's appropriate and sometimes it's not. In fact, again, in the Bible, it talks about how do you know when a thief is not a thief? Not when they stop stealing. That is not your indicator. It says when they start working and earning a living and then giving. So they're not just looking to take, they're actually now working themselves They're giving back to those that they took from, but also are quick to give out. That's when you can really know that a thief is no longer a thief. But the the simple fact of not stealing doesn't mean that there's a heart change. And so it's hard to tell, is this person really a new creature yet or not? I mean, the guy gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of meth, so I'm figuring there was a real heart change. But it might have been a guilt thing. He might have been on meth and was seeing seeing things. I don't know. But again, it's not always so cut and dry. It's the same with civil suits. Do you sue a non-believer that has done you wrong in the world? My parents had this happen to them. Now, my family has been poor their whole lives. I mean, at times, like seriously, seriously poor. That just usually comes along with ministry. And when my dad was a pastor, we never really owned a home until I was in eighth grade. Lived in small apartments with seven of us and sometimes a church parsonage. But this was the first time we ever bought a house where like, I mean, I still had to share a room with my brother, but like some of the kids actually got their own room. It was like crazy. But we had seven people living in one house with one bathroom. So besides my parents had a master bathroom, but five kids getting ready for school, they needed to get the, the bathroom renovated. And this was in the late 90s. And they gave a guy $12,000 check, which for my parents was probably their entire savings. My grandmother had passed, gave some money, uh, when she passed and they decided to renovate the bathroom, gave this guy $12,000. Well, we never saw him again. He took that twelve grand and split. And here are my parents, you know, five kids, no money. What do we do? We still need the thing fixed. And my parents were like, well, it, it is what it is. Like, we, we're going to pray for him. We're going to let it go. Um, we're Christians. We don't feel that it's right to chase after him. Now, the guy ended up getting arrested because he did a whole bunch of people for fraud. And they came to my parents like, do you want to get in on the civil suit? My parents said, we don't. If he feels it's right to give us our money back, then yes, we believe that's right, but we're not going to go after him for a civil suit. And to this day, I, I don't know specifically how I would handle that. It's, is that right or is that wrong? It's a little bit harder to see that in the Bible when we're talking about a Christian's response to a non-Christian. But I will say this. While there don't seem to be blanket black and white statements on that, there are certainly hints throughout the Bible on how to handle these things. And I would say I believe my parents handled it absolutely correct because 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12 says this. It's not on the screens. I added it this morning as I was studying and praying over this. But it says this in 1 Peter. To sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, which it says all throughout the Bible, or insult for insult, but give a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Let him turn away from evil and do good. And let him speak uh, peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So it would seem to me, biblically, that the best default position in Christianity is to not be very concerned about being defrauded here on earth. To not return evil for evil, but to let it go. And I know that's hard. And again, every situation is different. And if there's this billion dollar company that is taking money from you 
and, and your whole family's gonna lose their entire income. I mean, do you jump in on a civil lawsuit that somebody else is doing? Again, those are things you've gotta pray through, but I think as a whole, we certainly get our marching orders that for the most part, let it go. It's just money. God's gonna take care of you. And interesting enough, in here as well as in 1 Corinthians, he immediately pushes it to eternal things. Here he talks about eternal judgment and how we will judge the world, which we'll talk about here in a second. And as we just read in 1 Peter, he says, listen, you're gonna inherit eternal life. You're gonna inherit a whole lot more. It's okay to let go of things here on earth that you weren't gonna hold on to anyways. You've got a better inheritance coming. So sometimes, and I know it's hard, I really do, because I have always taken the mentality my entire Christian adult life is that I believe other people. Real estate agents, car salesmen, plumbers, mechanics, I actually believe them. And for the most part in my life, that means we have been ripped off at like every single turn. We just traded in our Jeep. Y'all have heard me talk about the Jeep. We got rid of it. But we got rid of the Jeep. But here's the thing. We're trading in the Jeep, and we, I thought I had in good conscience told the dealership, like, listen, it's, it's in average shape. We've put like 7,000 into repairing it, so it should be good enough. He's like, yeah, but here's the problem. The, the Carfax on it shows it's been in two major accidents, not like dingers, major accidents. I was like, no, -uh, I have the Carfax from when we bought it, and it's clean. And he's like, this is your Carfax. And I looked at it, and that was the Carfax for our VIN number. But when we bought it, it wasn't. We got a fake Carfax, and we fell for it. And our car was a lemon to begin with, and the guy knew it, but he sold it to us. And we're like, hey, we believe you. We're, we're gonna buy it. Like, this is between you and the Lord if you're lying to us. I always tell people that. Like, look, here's my situation. I just want you to know. I've got kids. We're barely scraping it by. I'm giving you a lot of money. This is a huge investment. If you're willing to rip me off, that's between you and the Lord, but I'm gonna allow you to do that because I'm believing you. And so far, 95% of the time, we've been ripped off. I'm serious. And, but... I do feel clear before the Lord. And so, again, it is not always super simple, but we said this in Ecclesiastes. Psalm says the only one who's gonna write a crooked path is the Lord. And everyone will have to give an account for their life. And for me, I would like to at least in those situations stand before the Lord and say, God, with an open and clean heart, I wanted to trust them and give them the benefit of the doubt. And yes, they stole from us, but... Lord, I know you're gonna take care of that. We trust you, you're gonna take care of us anyways. Because you know what? For all the times we've been ripped off, I've never gone without food. I've never gone without. God has always taken care of our family. And so it is hard, but we've got to let it go. And again, that's just, I believe, practical biblical advice and wisdom throughout the word on how a Christian deals with a non-believer. For the most part, you ought to be willing to be defrauded. There may be unique situations where you've gotta really push back from the law, but as a whole... I believe the default is you ought to be defrauded. However, Christian on Christian, the Bible is super clear. Very black and white. Don't sue. Figure it out. Actually, Paul says here, before figuring out, it would be best for you to just let it go. If, because of the hardness of your heart, and we see this throughout the Bible, it's like, listen, here's the right way to do it, but because we're stubborn, hard-hearted people, if you're gonna ignore the best situation, here's the next best thing. If you have to figure it out, if you have a problem with another believer that comes in the world of the civil matters, let the church handle it, not the outside world. The church should be able to figure these things out. When one party is so wronged and wishes to pursue things despite the fact that the Bible says you ought to let it go, but if the issue is forced, then at the very least, let it be settled by the church, not the secular court system. Because Paul's saying, what do they care about Christian mentalities? Now, Corinthian, Roman, Greek, right? That whole court system is infinitely different than an American court system. We'll talk about that shortly. But as a whole, if you've got an issue with another Christian, Paul says, unequivocally, the first best thing to do is reconcile. And if they will not reconcile, be willing to be defrauded. I've used this story before. When we bought our first home down in South Carolina, we bought it from the father of, a, of students in my youth group. 
completely and utterly lied about everything. And we found out very quickly. Remember, I told you all, I think, on my birthday when the whole AC went out and all that, and it was $14,000 to to repair the faulty wiring. And he lied to us about everything. And that was the parent of a student in our youth group. Now, did we go out and sue him? No, like I said, we're to this day paying off that debt. And we're figuring it out. I was not gonna take the guy to the courts and sue him because the Bible is very clear. He says he's a Christian and I'm not to take that before the courts. We ought to be able to figure this out. Yes, he should have reimbursed us, but he didn't. So Paul is saying when you've got those issues with each other, somebody from the church decided to do work on your house, they sold you a car. There's many different issues that within a church community, we help each other out. And sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes the car's wrong, you did the work wrong. There's a lot of different scenarios that can come from that, but Paul says, first and foremost, let it go. All right, they sold you a car, it ended up being a lemon. Don't come to church the next week and start a fight. Say, hey, this is what happened. And if they say, hey, too bad, yeah, that's not how they should respond, but then you've got to let it go. But if somebody pursues it, at the very least, go to the church leadership and say, can you help us figure this out in a biblical manner? instead of going to the courts and actually suing them and dragging this before the public, which again, we'll talk about how it was very different back then and why it was even more significant back then. But he says to them, again, he pushed it in an eternal perspective. Don't you know that Christians will judge the world and angels on eternal matters? If you're gonna sit in the seat, a judgment seat for the world and for angels of cosmic level, eternal consequence, you're telling me you guys can't figure out that he sold you a bad car? You can't figure that out as Christ followers? There's, Paul says it. There's not one person in the church wise enough to figure out how to get two arguing brothers to come back together, two whom Christ died for. You guys can't figure this out as a family. You're going to courts and bashing each other on the public stage in order to get a couple bucks. That's how much money means to you? That's a problem. We shouldn't be like that. Especially, again, he says, because in end times, do you realize what type of position you're going to, be, you're going to hold? He gets that from the Bible, right? Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, he is talking to his disciples at that point, but is he saying to just them? I don't believe so, especially because one of them was Judas at that point, and Judas certainly won't be sitting on one of those. There is some sort of judgment that Christians partake in for eternity. The Bible does not elaborate specifically how, but there are many references in Jude, in Revelation. We see it here in Matthew 19. We see it in a different reference in Luke twenty two thirty, 30, where Jesus says, that you may eat and drink at my table when they're arguing over who's more important, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There are references throughout the Bible that Christians will sit in seats of judgment for of eternal consequence, judging the world and judging angels. And so if we're gonna sit discerning those types of matters, how come we can't figure out these insignificant matters of somebody defrauded you of a couple billion dollars? Who cares? It's just a couple billion What if it's a couple trillion? Who cares? It's just money. Does it really matter? Trillions versus five cents. We're supposed to be Christian brethren. Is there not something more important than being defrauded? It says in order to avoid these things, we must have an eternal mindset. Which again is why I see in 1 Peter and here that he pushes them to end times things. Yes, in the moment, it hurts when somebody rips you off, but in the long run, does it really matter? You were not bringing any of that with you anyways. Have an eternal mindset, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on those things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, 
Boy, if we ought to have a mindset, it is this. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. That's what we are. We are currently in a foreign land. If you are a Christ follower, you're in a foreign land. Which is why the word ambassador is used so many times. You represent the king of heaven here on earth. That in Christ, we are already secure in heaven. Our place in heaven is secure, but we are currently here in a foreign land with an objective. We are to represent the Lord and his kingdom here in a foreign land as aliens and strangers. As aliens and strangers, we ought to look a little different than everybody else. We ought to act a little bit different. Again, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your, excel, you keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. Don't give them ammo. Don't give the world ammo of these Christians act like this, these Christians act like this. If they're going to insult you, let it be that you're doing the right things, not the wrong things. Have such a perspective that we are aliens. This is not our home. And I know how hard it is, how sticky everything is in this world. But we have to keep that eternal perspective that this is not our home. This is not where we will reside forever. And so we ought to turn our hearts, our actions, our thoughts completely towards eternity. So if somebody within the church hurts you, whether it be your feelings or in a civil matter, let it go. I know that's hard. Right? I mean, I'm a guy. Guys are, we're fighters. Like, no, I'm going to show them. No. Again, you call sin, sin, and there are things that need to be confronted. We just talked about that, which is probably why this followed right up. There are outward, overt sins that the church needs to confront. We need to talk through those things for the purpose of reconciliation. But when somebody defrauds you, it should not be, I'm going to get back at them. Jesus, again, makes this very clear in a parable that we'll read shortly, but what about this in Matthew 6, 19 through 24? We could probably spend our lives in in these verses. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, riches. You cannot serve God and riches. You cannot serve both. Your heart is going to go wherever your treasures are. So if you're storing up treasures in heaven, if your objective is to honor the Lord here on earth, then your heart is going to be there with the Lord and you're going to treat people with that kind of heart. But if your whole life's trajectory and objective has been me, 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 then yes, you're going to sue others. You're going to pursue those things because you're saying, hey, they've, they've defrauded me. I'm going to get right. I'm going to make this right here and now. And the Bible says you've got to let that stuff go. Again, no matter what it is, they could defraud you of anything and it can be gone tomorrow anyways. Thieves can steal it. It can just disappear or you may pass away and it's not coming with you. You've got to let earthly things go. We've got to learn to forgive and focus on reconciliation. Again, this is not a suggestion. These are very, very serious commands in the Bible. Look at what Jesus says about those that don't forgive. Matthew 18, which is following up, if you remember from last week, the instructions on how to confront sin. One-on-one, two-on-one, then bring them before the church. Then the disciples are like, yeah, but like, what if they keep defrauding me? I know I'm supposed to forgive them, but what if they like actually get reconciled to the church, but then they do it to me again? Now, Jesus, now I can really let him have it, right? Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Again, right on the cusp of how to handle church discipline. Up to seven times, they want an actual number. Like, come on, reach that eighth, so now I can be justified in my anger towards you. 
Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And again, in that culture, it means infinite. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly father also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Again, very, very, very serious words from Jesus. If the Lord has forgiven us of so much, and you all know who you are, you all know the sins of your heart and your mind, let alone the things that some of you have committed in dark corners, maybe before the Lord or after the Lord, you know what God has forgiven you of, Why are we so slow to forgive others? And that is what Paul is saying. That is what Jesus is saying. How can you not, in your heart, reconcile with each other whom Christ died for? Let it go. We are so quick for that self-righteous, oh, but I'm right and they're wrong. Perhaps, you very well may be, but we've got to learn to forgive. We've got to forgive each other. So that right there is really, in a nutshell, how we ought to handle each other, especially in civil matters. Paul is very direct. I mean, he's he's used some very, very strong language here as he's telling those in Corinth, like, I cannot believe you do not understand this. You cannot treat other Christians this way. It's so black and white that he just rolls on. He doesn't need to expound upon it. Don't do it. Don't sue other believers. Let it go. It's better to be defrauded than to sue others, but especially in this type of context, because you have to understand in Corinth, the way that their law system worked is very different than ours. Number one, and this is actually heavily documented. This is something I learned a lot this week through uh, extra biblical resources of historical cultural context of that time. And it was heavily written upon the way that laws were handled, especially in Corinth around that time. We have a plethora of knowledge, so we can learn a lot. It's really cool. And I learned a lot this week about this. The way that their court system worked was almost 100% of the time, period, the richer person won the case, no matter what. So if a rich person went against a poor person, that poor person was pretty much guaranteed to lose, especially because the rich person would pay off everybody else, everybody ran in the same circles, and so they made sure their buddies were taken care of. Actually, I guess it's not probably that different than our current governmental world, but as a whole, This was very well known. The rich guy is going to win. But here's the thing that was very different back then, okay? Because it was, we've said this before in Corinth, it was all about rhetoric. It was all about public speaking. This was their main platform for character assassinations. This was the number one platform where you drug somebody else into court and during your time to speak, you just destroyed that person publicly so that by the time it was over, everybody was like, of course that person ought to pay you money. In fact, not only that, throw them in prison, kill them. You've just painted, that guy shouldn't even be in our society. They are the worst person ever. And so there were major character assassinations. assassinations. And you can imagine Paul saying, this is, I'm hearing it's the same way with the church. You're polling your Christian brother before the public and you're shredding them. And in verse 9 9 through 11, I believe that he provides Christians a very intense warning and also a deep 
encouragement. So I would like you all to look at it this way. If, if you would follow along with me for a second in a, in a fake story. So let's say there's somebody in our church named Ezekiel. We'll just call him Zeke. Is there anybody here named Ezekiel? Because I don't want somebody being like, I knew it. This is why I don't come to church. Knew I'd be the example. No? All right. So we're safe. Let's say there's someone in the congregation named Zeke. Zeke used to live on the streets. He was a drug abuser for 20 years. And the only job he was ever able to get was an exotic dancer. Yes, he was a male exotic dancer. And I know this is an uncomfortable conversation, but we're going to get more uncomfortable in some of the language here. The, Paul that, the, the language that Paul uses here in the Greek is super, super graphic and super intense. I honestly don't even think I can get into it as far as what he's saying here in verses 9 through 11 as to what people have been doing in their personal lives, what sort of sins they've been committing. We will talk about that in a second, but let's say this, this was Zeke, right? New believer, had been homeless for a long time, living on the streets on purpose, loved his drugs, and just made money by being an exotic dancer or male prostitute or something like that. Now, let's say he's been coming to church for like a year. Zeke's turn, turned his life around. He's a new creature under Christ. He's trying to serve the Lord. He's, he's having trouble getting a job because of his past and stuff like that. And I'm like, hey, my Jeep's broken down for the 78th time. I heard you're a mechanic. You can kind of work on cars. And he comes and he fixes the car. But instead, he makes the problem much worse. And I decide I'm going to sue Zeke. Like, dude, you messed up my car. I have no money to fix it. I'm going to sue him. So I take him to court. And not only do I sue him for the damage to the car, I sue him for mental anguish, right, all the other things. This is my cash cow. I'm going to figure out ways to get money out of him. But here's the thing, okay? This is the context of this type of, type of court system in Corinth. Not only that, this is my time to make sure I'm going to win my case. I bring up before the entire court system his past. And just destroy him publicly in front of everybody to ensure that there's no way they're ever going to side with him. Are you kidding me? Listen, I'm a pastor. This Zeke guy, he used to be an exotic dancer. He used to use drugs. Of course, this. there's no way that you can side with this guy. And the rest of society is like, yeah, I'm not going to side with him. I don't want to be a part of that. That's how it worked in Corinth. You use the platform to drag out people's pasts and to make all their sins known to everybody. And this is what Christians were doing to other Christians. So two things are happening here. In that type of scenario, one, I'm showing what type of person I am by doing that. And that's where the warning is here from Paul. You're doing this to your Christian brothers. He says, you're defrauding them. You're, you're defaming them in front of everybody. You're doing this, so you're showing what kind of person you are. And there's a very serious warning there. But then there's also an encouragement. See, Zeke, on the second half, is feeling like he will always be defined by his past. So two things have happened. I have now shown what type of person I am, but Zeke also is sitting over here like, man, the pastor is telling me I'm always going to be this dirty, rotten sinner. I'm defined by these things. So at the end of this trial, I'm feeling vindicated. Again, this is how it was working here in Corinth. The church, those who say I'm Christ followers, this is how they were living. At the end of this trial, I'm feeling vindicated. When what I really ought to be feeling is terrified for what type of character I have displayed publicly towards Zeke. What kind of person I have shown myself to be. I ought to be terrified, but I'm feeling vindicated because, hey... The court system went with me, and that's how the Corinthians were feeling. Hey, I won the case. I bashed my other brother. I'm getting my money. They said I'm in the right, so therefore I'm in the right, when really he's saying you ought to be terrified by the way that you're acting. And Zeke is feeling terrified. I'm always going to be this, this low nobody, when he ought to be encouraged by the fact that he is a new creation. That's what he should be experiencing within the church, but he's not. He's being called before the court system and having his past drug out in order to win a case. He's being destroyed. So I'd like to focus on some things here that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. He uses 10 sins here. Do not be deceived. Do not be fooled. 
Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the earth. These are what we would call habitual characterizing sins. See, in the Greek, these are actually all nouns. None of them are verbs. Every one of them is a noun, which means, it's very significant, it means that you haven't just committed these sins at some point, but rather you have been driven by them. They have characterized essentially your life. It is what type of person you are. They're part of your DNA. They're what makes you up. Galatians 5 shows us this a little bit as well. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, uh, factions, envying, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, you've got a list there, you've got a list here of a lifestyle that if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Greek word there for practice in Galatians means to busy oneself with that activity. In an even deeper way, it means to occupy you. It drives your decisions. The word actually leans all the way into your thought life. So it's those whose thoughts also push you towards that realm. It occupies your headspace, which ultimately determines how you act. We all understand these types of things. If any of you have a job that you do not enjoy and you're just about to go on a vacation... It's that kind of mindset, the two hours before the clock strikes whatever it's gonna strike where you're done and you get to go on vacation. What are you thinking about that last day of work? Vacation. You're like, man, I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to do that. You're thinking in your head how much you're gonna enjoy it. You're making plans towards it. You're not really being productive at work or as productive as you could be. In fact, I was just talking to Paul right, right before this, the last couple of weeks of school for kids. Are they really doing that much, right? Because the teachers too are like, I'm done. Nobody blames them. If you have like a two days or three days in the week left before the end of the year, if you don't like finish out a full week, but you're like, the kids are coming back for one more Monday and Tuesday. Let's be honest. Everybody's in summer vacation mode. Like they just are. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying it's that kind of mindset. You're in that summer vacation mode. And that's what it's talking about with practice and these characterizing downs in that your whole life, you think that type of way. How can I get this? How can I garner this? You're covetous, you're a liar, you're envious, sexual immorality, idolatry, homosexuality. All of these things are talking about, and you know what this is like. Every one of you does. It occupies you. It's not just a, oh man, I ended up cheating on my wife. It's that for 15 years you were struggling with sexual immorality and lust and pornography and inappropriate conversations with women and your thought life and all of that stuff that at some point it acted itself out. Of course it did. You've already been that person for a very long time. And that is what the Bible is talking about. It is also a heart issue. We will see in 1 Corinthians 7 when it talks about burning a passion in your heart, it is... It is separated from action. So the burning in your heart is also a problem. We see Jesus talk about it in Matthew 5. If you say that you have sinful desires that you don't act on it, that it's okay. That is not true. God is concerned about the heart. Those that live in their head with these sins are characterized by those sins according to the Bible. Just because it lives in your head and your heart and you don't act on all of them does not mean the Bible doesn't label you as those as nouns. The Bible labels you with them as nouns. You are characterized by that. If you live with that sinful thought and heart, you camp in that, that world of, oh, I may never act on this, but I would like to. That is a problem. It is a sin problem. It is a habitual characterization problem of who you are. So again, those who have lived in their minds chasing these sins and those who have acted on them will not inherit the kingdom of God. This list is 10 nouns. They're habits within the heart, the mind. 
and they play themselves out in actions. They're a life where these things dominate and they propel you forward. It's kind of like saying, I'm a baseball player. That's a noun. If somebody says, I'm a baseball player, yes, you assume they can play baseball, but you also have a whole lot of other assumptions of what type of lifestyle they have had. And this is the same thing. If you're an idolater, a fornicator, a homosexual, and all these other things that it lists, it's not just that you acted within them, it's that your whole mindset has been driving you towards that. That's the type of person that you are. And if that's the type of person that you are, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But notice this. No noun here is more significant than the other. There is a very aggressive and direct language here talking about specific sins, which I may kind of touch on, but they're very graphic. In your English Bible, they're not graphic. The words used here in the Greek for effeminate and homosexual are super graphic and descriptive, but your translation just says effeminate or homosexual, or perhaps some of yours says sodomite or male prostitute, but it's actually in the Greek means a whole lot more than that. But there is direct language, and some is a little bit more forceful, but all of them are a problem. So let's make two side notes on that. Look, these verses in, that we read in Galatians as well as 1 Corinthians 6 shatter. Listen, they ought to shatter the idea of somebody calling themselves a homosexual Christian. You cannot be a homosexual Christian. You cannot be defined by a sin and also add in Christian. You cannot be both. One can be a Christian who has a homosexual past. One may be a Christian who struggles with pervasive homosexual thoughts, but one may not be a homosexual Christian. You cannot say I'm both a homosexual and a Christian. I'm both sexually immoral and a Christian. I'm an idolater and a Christian. You cannot be both. You can sin. You can be tempted. You can mess up, right? And we ask forgiveness and we get back up and we try to live properly. But if you define yourself and just say, this is the type of person I am, this is who God made me to be, the Bible says then you will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. Every one of these words is a noun. So if you define yourself as a noun, I'm this, I'm a homosexual Christian, you're not a Christian. The Bible says it cannot be. And I am hitting that sin harder because of culture. And I will make my second point with that specific sin of homosexuality. But again, don't miss it here. That's not the only sin listed. Again, you can't be a Christian fornicator, which by the way, the Greek word just means sexual immorality. Those that are not married, if you have had a lifestyle of struggling with lust, of just it drives everything you do, says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot be a Christian drunkard. You cannot be a Christian partier. Yeah, I just, you know, on weekends, I love to go to these parties, but it's really just, you know, it's just one of my guilty pleasures. You cannot define yourself as both. Your life should not be defined by greed or status or power, chasing after the American dream or somebody who has struggled with the same idols their entire life, you should not be those things. If you are, the Bible says, if that has been your lifestyle, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I will say this, we live in a society currently obsessed with gender issues and homosexuality, which is why I'm drawing this out here for a second. And many so-called Christians have determined that you can be a homosexual Christian. And they're now saying this at an institutional level. The Catholic Church, right, just recently within the last, I believe, four months, said they're now allowing priests to bless homosexual marriages. They can decide not to, but they have been told that they can bless homosexual marriages. The Pope himself has said priests can now bless those in homosexual marriages. Just within this last six weeks, The United Methodist denomination voted and has stated you can be a homosexual priest, let alone a Christian. So you can be defined by this, an active lifestyle of I am a lesbian or homosexual priest, and they say not a problem. You can can still run a church. You can do everything. It's just who you are. This is the so-called church that is saying this is okay. It is condemned in the Bible, very 
very clearly. Listen, Leviticus is very clear on this, but then the world will tell you this. Yeah, but there's a lot of other rules in Leviticus that we don't follow. And you may not be very good in your Bible or well-versed in your Bible, and you kind of get beat up in that type of conversation. You're like, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, okay, I can see where this really isn't that big of a problem. I want to give you a tool in your back pocket so that specifically, listen, this is not a tool to beat people over the head with. This is a tool for you so that you are not tossed around by every wind or wave of doctrine because many have fallen to this. They watch a YouTube video, hear something else where somebody says, did you know the word homosexual is not in the, in the, Old Te- or in the New Testament? Correct, there's no English word in the New Testament. Good job. You're, you're a, ling- a ling- lingual scholar. Yes, there are no English words in the, in the New Testament. They, they trick you already there. The word homosexual does not appear in the New Testament. You are correct. The words are way more graphic. They're way worse. They're way more descriptive. And again, some people are grown up in their lives and they hear you should not uh, have different relations before you get married, right? And they hear this their whole lives, but they're like, but I don't even really know where it says that in the Bible. What well, says it here? It says it in Hebrews. I mean, again, it doesn't scream it in the English, but it screams it in the Greek. That there are different words, morkai and pornia, right? For when you're married, it switches. The Greek word switches because then it becomes adultery. If you have sexual lust or sexual problems when you're married, it becomes adultery. But outside of marriage, which is everybody else, if you struggle with lust, it is moikaya. It is sexual immorality. Any bit of that is sexual immoral. It is sexually immoral. And it is wrong. And any sexual anything outside of marriage is incorrect. The Bible speaks it clearly, but many people are like, well, I've just always heard it, but I don't know where it says it in the Bible. It's the same with homosexuality. Unfortunately, we live in a society that promotes it. This is right the month where they promote it. And they say, it's okay. The Bible doesn't say that there's anything wrong with it. And they trick Christians into being like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that the Bible doesn't say anything against it. Know your Bible. Here's a tool. It says it. It is so incredibly clear right here. And of course, the way computers work, because this is the work I've been doing this week and a lot of Greek studies and different things, that what pops up on my screen for my Microsoft Bing was like, you should watch this YouTube video. And I'm like, let's do it. It's like a 20 second clip of this young man that decides to go to a gay pride parade and he starts preaching this verse or just yelling it through a through a, an air phone. Now, again, I would say not the best tactic. I don't really, I don't believe that's what the Bible talks about. That's really, I don't like that. But he was doing it. And these people come up to him and the guy starts yelling at him. That's not in the Bible. The word homosexual isn't in the Bible. And, and the younger guy's like, just keeps reading the verse. And then the guy says, you don't know Hebrew. How could you possibly know what the Bible says? Which this wasn't written in Hebrew. This would have been Greek. But what I'm trying to tell you is you can tell the person, you're right, I don't know Greek, but I will tell you this. The the word here for effeminate, and I'm not gonna get too descriptive, but one, it kind of means a male who is tend towards feminine uh, actions, likes to look a little bit more feminine, but it gets very graphic in the Greek in the physical interactions of two men that this is the receiver. That is what this word means. And the next word for homosexual is actually very aggressive in the Greek that this is the man who likes to dominate. And there's there, the Greek, the specific lexical Greek definitions for these, both, both, both use the word penetration. We'll leave it at that on both ends. There's a giver and a taker. That is what Paul is using here in a very aggressive language. That if you are either of those in any way, shape, or form, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so when the world tries to tell you, well, you don't know, the Bible doesn't say that, it screams it. It is wrong, sinful behavior. But guess what? So is everything surrounding it, the idolatry, the adultery, the lust. The reason the church has lost a lot of its voice in that type of realm is because statistically, the church has more divorces than not divorces and due to adultery. And so the world says, listen, y'all were sleeping around yourself, so how, how dare you tell me I can't do it with a man when you're over there, you're, you got half your congregation sleeping around. Now, two wrongs don't make a right, but all of these are problems. But again, culturally, I want you to have a tool when you watch somebody or hear some debate like, 
No, you can be a homosexual Christian or the Bible doesn't say anything against it. Listen, here's your tool. Highlight it, do whatever. The Bible says it is wrong. You cannot be characterized by it and those who are will not inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, it ends with these people start dumping all their drinks and throwing stuff at this kid and then the YouTube video ends. Um, It's interesting. But these things are, these conversations are happening. They're happening at our highest levels at courts. They're happening in our schools. They're happening all over the place. And you may not change minds by knowing this, but you yourself don't get dragged along with the rest of the culture saying, oh, well, I guess the Bible doesn't really have much to say about this. It does. It's crystal clear. Take a stand. Be strong. But not just on that sin, on sin. Let's take a strong standpoint on sin. Let's hate the sin that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. Let's hate all of it and encourage each other not to live that way. Revelation 21, eight, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters, and listen, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Make no mistake, if you are characterized by that lifestyle, you will spend eternity in hell. But finally, let's get back to Zeke. Paul here encourages him Yes, yes, Zeke, you used to be defined by those things. You used to be these things, and so were many of you. That's what Paul says here. Yes, many of you were these things. Listen, what does he say in verse 11? And such were some of you, right? They're dragging each other to court. This guy was this. This guy was a male prostitute at the, at, down at, at the temple of Diana. Of course he owes me money. I was never that. I've been this my whole life. This Christian bre- brother used to be, how can we trust a guy who used to be a male prostitute? How can we trust a guy who used to work at this temple or that temple? They were destroying each other. And Paul says, he extends the list. Well, how about y'all? Listen, such were some of you, but, listen, but, you were washed. But, and each time, he adds this for emphasis. It's, in Greek, it's the word Allah, but, 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 but. Listen, let me turn, let me turn your mindset. Let me totally steer you the other way. Yes, you used to be a fornicator, an adulterer, an idolater, a liar, a greedy person, a drunkard, a partier, a reviler, a homosexual. You used to be these deplorable things, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You are not those things anymore. There may be consequences from those actions, but you are not those things. Don't listen to the world. Don't listen to anybody else telling you that's what you are. You aren't. You are washed by the king of kings. Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Let the king define you as what you are, not the world. These Greek words, washed, it means purified. Sanctified is not the process of becoming more Christ-like. It is not the same Greek word here of conforming to the image of Christ. It is, again, we have used this Greek word before. It is the status of having been taken from something awful and placed aside for holy use. Heavy, heavy emphasis in the Old Testament on temple instruments that were made out of gold and things used in the Holy of Holies, the tent of meeting where God himself came down. It is that, it is that you have been set aside. You have been washed clean. You have been sanctified. You have been taken for a purpose, made holy, separate. You have been pulled out of the world for a holy purpose. That is what that word means. A beautiful, amazing, by the way, passive verb. It was done to you. You didn't do it. It was done for you. 
to you by Jesus Christ. He's the active one in this. You are the passive recipient of that. He has washed you and set you aside for a purpose, and he has justified you. You're justified by grace through faith. That is the kind of justification he is talking about here. It's the only time he uses it in either letter to Corinth. It is a very unique Greek word that is, only, that is used heavily also in Romans and Galatians when he is expounding upon the idea of justification by grace. Again, a passive word here that you have been taken and cleansed. You have been set aside for holy use. And you have been given a standing before the, before the king of kings where he has something for you to do. When I was in the Marines, especially we, right when we had to go clean the bathrooms, especially if you got in trouble, and you did, you had to get a toothbrush and you had to go clean the toilets or the grout of the shower of, that 150 men just used. And you've got to go in there with a toothbrush and you're sitting there and you're scrubbing all this stuff out after like a week out in the field. Imagine how that looks and you're scraping all that. That's you. You're that toothbrush. And God has washed you. I mean, that's what he's saying. Yes, you used to be in that muck. Yes, that used to be you. But God has washed you. He has sanctified you. He has taken you out of that world and placed you in the Holy of Holies that you are being used for a purpose, a beautiful, gorgeous purpose for the king. He has not only declared you righteous, he has given you his righteousness. Not only, do you not, not only do you not have to live in that sinful behavior, but you now have the tools and the equipment through Jesus Christ to now serve properly. Not only are you not gonna continually do evil, you can now do good. Don't be defined by the past. Be defined by that. You have been washed, sanctified, and justified. That is beautiful. So listen, don't be defined by the past. Live in the new status provided by Christ's blood and treat each other as though others have as well. And if you are defined still by these sins, repent. Because you either need to currently get right because you're in a season of you've stepped out and you know when it's a season and when it's a lifestyle. You may be caught in a season of sin, repent. Confess, repent, get right before the Lord. But if you're in that lifestyle, you know that's been your lifestyle, repent because you don't know him. Ask Christ to forgive you, to be washed, to be sanctified, to be justified. So you may inherit the kingdom of God. You may have a relationship with the Lord and you may be used for his purposes. What a beautiful, amazing set of verses. And that leads us into communion, which is perfect. So let's pray and we'll celebrate communion. We're reminding us of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. So let's pray as the men come forward. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we enter into communion, Lord, I am constantly Lord, I look in your word and I have no right to partake. Lord, and such were some of you. Lord, there's some sins that I have never struggled with and there are others, Lord, that you list that I absolutely lived by, within. And Lord, you have washed me clean by your son's blood and I pray that I would live as though I'm somebody who has been redeemed. Lord, that as we partake of communion, that we would celebrate the fact that you have washed us clean through your son's blood. Lord, I pray for anybody in this room that does not know you, that today would be the day that they repent of their sin, recognize they cannot stand before a holy God, but they can if they would accept your son as their savior and the price that he paid on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, as we uh, celebrate communion here, you don't have to be a member of this church, but you do have to be a member of Christ's body. You do have to be a believing Christ follower. If you are a Christ follower that's stuck in sin right now and you have not repented, let the elements pass. Get right with the Lord before you take this. But take this time now to spend some time with the Lord, thanking him for what he's done. Ask for forgiveness if you need to. Um, but again, you don't have to be a member of this church, but we do ask that you are a Christ follower before you partake. So we'll have a moment of silence as we pass this out, and then we will partake.
I'm going to pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, again, I come before you as just an individual, Lord, who, who sins consistently. And Lord, also struggles with, with my own past, Lord, and things that I have done. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for washing me. Using me. Lord, I pray that I am used for your glory. I pray for each individual in this room that we would be used for your glory. What an honor to be an instrument of yours. Lord, we have been washed clean with your son's blood. Lord, I pray that that is what we genuinely are celebrating here today. In Jesus' name, amen. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and, which, <clears throat> and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Again, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that we would genuinely worship you from our heart, with our lives and our minds. The fact that your body was bruised and broken, your blood was shed for our salvation. Lord, that we could be made right before a holy God, that we could have a relationship with him and a genuine, true, loving relationship with each other. Lord, all of us will offend each other at some time. Lord, we will be offended. Some of us may be genuinely uh, treated wrong. Lord, in, in civil matters or in emotional or in gossip or in so many different ways. And Lord, sin ought to be caught out and it ought to be dealt with. But Lord, we also should forgive each other. And Lord, I pray that that would happen within this church. That we would love each other. Lord, I know that I need to as well. And Lord, I just pray you would open my eyes to see these things, my heart to love the way that you love. And Lord, I pray that each one in this room would be the same. Lord, thank you for not leaving us as we were, for washing us. Lord, what a calling. I pray that we would live that out for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. You're dismissed. Have a good day.